Okay, so this, um, thanks again, Sebri, for inviting me. Um, this has been very productive. Um, so this is the, the final session. So this time, instead of um, having a handout that simply kind of, you know, recapitulates, you know, the, uh, the main points of the paper, which I think everyone's uh, had a chance to read, um, I'm just going to quickly summarize uh, or try to summarize, you know, the, the argument of the paper and then um, point to um, the direction because this is work in progress and it's, uh, it's un under revision um, in a way in that, in that discuss, um, you know, ways in which I'm, you know, I'm trying to develop the line of thought um, you know, sketched in this in this paper. Um, so, and that's so the material on the handout is kind of um, is directly you know is, is an, an extrapolation from the themes kind of addressed in the uh, in, in the text of the of the paper you've read. Um, so, what is yeah the paper? It simply begins with um, you know a critical examination of um, so-called uh, critical posthumanism, which is one, uh, a variety of posthumanism. There's not, there are, are, there, there are more than one. Uh, there's also speculative posthumanism, which David works represents. Um, but in a way, this, the examination of this critical posthumanism is to query the credibility of the prefix critical, um, with which it kind of, um, you know, baptizes itself. Um, uh, this is, um, you know, the, the, the paper, the, uh, the representative of this stance exam, whose work is examined is uh, Rosie Bridotti, who's, you know, kind of, I guess, the foremost exponent of this position. Um, and in a way, in the course of the, um, uh, of the analysis, um, I'm interested in, you know, foregrounding the, um, the significance of Deleuze and Guattari's work in particular, and especially specifically their engagement with Marx, um, as the uh, you know the the background for the characterization of capital uh, proposed by Bridotti's version of critical posthumanism, um, and it's this actually characterization I want to kind of in a way revisit in the. Um, uh, in the, the latter half of this kind of presentation. Um, it basically, um, you know, the, the claim is simply that the human is not a natural kind. Um, and that's the, in a way, philosophical, the kind of the peculiarity of um, the, of say, kind of Marxian humanism is precisely to propose that um, what mediates uh, biological and technological processes um, of production is social production. Uh, and that there is no shortcut from the biological to the technological or even the technocultural domain. Uh, and I take the significance of Marx's work to be to get Marx's analysis of, of the social forms which condition, uh, you know, reproduction um, under capital, uh, provides the indispensable mediating links for understanding um, how articulated. So in other words, it's the, it's the alternative to a kind of... Um, to a kind of an uncritical metaphysical shortcutting or fusing of culture and nature. And in a way, Deleuze and Guattari are, you know, exemplify the most sophisticated attempt to challenge and to subvert this kind of, uh, you know, post Kantian uh, demarcation of, uh, you know, let, let's say kind of the normative from the natural. But as I tried to kind of to show in the, uh, the discussion of Deleuze and Guattari last week. Um, I'm not, I think the way in which they do so, um, you know, reinstates a fusion, okay? A kind of a fusion of, of, uh, of the normative and the natural in a way which, you know, is, 
I think, questionable. Um, so that's the uh, you know the the basis up, upon which the uh, the critique of critical posthuman is carried out, and then. Um, I take that to exemplify what I call humanism's subversion from below. In other words, the collapsing of kind of uh, the distinction between, you know, uh, you know, nature and culture, um, or, or nature and civilization from below. Um, and I then I I, I can contrast this to what I call its decapitation from above, which I think is exemplified by by Derrida's work. Um, and the second part of the essay is um, uh, an examination of Derrida's The Ends of Man, uh, is, which is, is 1968. I think it was written in 1968, but published in uh, Margins of Philosophy in 1972. And this, I think, is, um, is an attempt you know, you know, to deconstruct the complicity between metaphysics and humanism. In other words, it doesn't simply um, you know, uh, reinscribe the human uh, within, the, you know, the, the domain of nature, understood as a, as a kind of domain of, of, of processes, flux of becoming, etc. Um, but it tries to kind of um, to show how the um, um, how metaphysics itself, that you know, and metaphysical ontology. Um, however, um, is always um, carried out in a, a secret compact with humanism. Um, and the Derrida's claim is that the, um, you know, any, the proclamations of the end of the human, um, which were very much in there, you know, 50 years ago when Derrida was, was writing this, um, actually hinges on um, you know, the, the termination or the supersession of the human um, you know, is conditioned by its culmination. So that you know, the, there are two senses of end at work in the, uh, the trope of you know, the end of the human, you know, the, the end of man, um, such that the uh, you know, the supersession uh, secretly invites, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, a conditioning by a completion. Um, and every completion also implies a kind of a, a supersession. And it, it's this interplay between the two, you know, the, the, it's a way in which um, completion supplements termination uh, that Derrida critically analyzes and he traces this back to kind of, uh, you know, the, the, the metaphysics of presence and the privileging of self-consciousness as self-presence in, um, even in the kind of the allegedly kind of, uh, you know, non-metaphysical critical tradition initiated by Kant. So the claim is that uh, Kant and Hegel uh, are the, the primacy or the privileging of self-consciousness in Kant, Hegel and arguably even Marx, is itself tributary to this kind of metaphysical privileging of self-presence, um, which Derrida, following Heidegger, understands as uh, the determination of presence in terms of the present, in terms of the temporal modality of the present. And what is very interesting about Derrida's account is that he both kind of, in a way, um, seems to endorse Heidegger's you know, kind of relegation of Hegelian dialectics and therefore of the line leading from Hegel to Marx to the problematic of, um, uh, you know, the, uh, the subordination of presence to the present. And yet at the same time, he also uh, pinpoints um, a significant, um, a divergence or uh, between Hegel's concept of presence um, and the Heideggerian, um, you know, concept of presence, or, or rather, he says that there's something in Hegel's account of presence, um, and you know, the, the coming to presence of self-consciousness that can't simply, or can't so easily, um, be identified with its the subordination to of presence to the present. Okay, 
and he points this out, but only, and then just leaves it kind of hanging. He doesn't follow up on this thought. Um, and it's, it's a fascinating moment in Derrida's text because I think, you know, Derrida's, you know, most acute critical insights uh, with regard to Heidegger and especially the, the pathos of propriety and of proximity uh, in Heidegger and uh, Derrida's, you know, uh, really kind of, you know, brilliant exposition of the, um, you know, the interplay of kind of proximity and distance, how this conditions his, his whole kind of, um, you know, his uh, allegedly critical diagnosis of the metaphysics of presence um, is that, that, you know, the, the interdependence of um, you know, proximity and distance. I think uh, in Derrida shows a kind of a dialectical kind of, um, you know, a, a dialectical interplay between those two concepts. So that I think that there's a kind of, a, you know, a, a subterranean kind of dialectical critique of Heideggerian deconstruction, um, which animates, um, you know, Derrida's, what, what Derrida still proclaims as a kind of a, a still a radical accentuation of deconstruction or an attempt to go further than Heidegger by trying to kind of, um, to show that even Heidegger himself is not entirely free of the, um, you know, the, uh, the pathos of self-presence. Um, and the claim is that ultimately, because, you know, Derrida's attempt, you know, to kind of to, you know, to distance himself from Heidegger using Heideggerian uh, resources ends up you know, with the recourse to kind of an absolute alterity, okay, an absolute alterity, which Derrida knows full well can't be kind of uncritically affirmed or proclaimed, but has also to be reinscribed within the text of metaphysics. So that uh, this, you know, this alterity or this kind of pure transcendence can only be kind of, um, you know, tentatively kind of, um, you, know, um, you know, put to work uh, in thinking um, in, the, in the, the kind of the, the program of Derrida and deconstruction. But I think that Derrida, you know, is caught in a double bind in a way because he the only alternative to the closure, you know, the, the self-enclosure of, of presence and of self-consciousness, et cetera, is something like this kind of, um, this radical alterity, this exteriority. But as Derrida knows full well, every kind of, you know, proclamation of exteriority presupposes an interiority. So it's the kind of the way, so the, the exterior has to somehow be inscribed within the interior. And I think this is the kind of, uh, you know, the, 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 the problematic or, you know, um, that is um, at the heart of Derrida's um, critical extension of Heidegger's program. Um, but in a way, it leaves, um, I think, ultimately, kind of, uh, it disarms deconstruction. Um, and in a way, um, I think that had Derrida pursued um, or, or kind of uh, pursued the, um, the intimation that, you know, that he himself gives that there's something um, in the, uh, about the kind of, in, in the Hegelian conception of self-consciousness, self-consciousness as kind of, you know, as a relation to self through the other, um, that's, in a way, um, is perfectly consonant with this problem about the um, the negotiation between inside and outside, but can be developed in a you know is is kind of uh, you know unpacked in a materialist register by Marx through the um, the whole um, you know the. Well, first of all, through the kind of the, you know, the transplanting of self-consciousness or the dynamic of self-exteriorizing consciousness in, in labor, but then in, in the mature marks, in the marks of capital, in the analysis of the way in which labor and capital um, become interdependent and co-constitutive. Um, so that's in a way the, 
the radical exteriority um, you know, sought for by Derrida and in a way the kind of uh, the, uh, you know, the, uh, the supersession of the kind of uh, of the um, of the philosophical trope, the philosophical kind of understanding of humanity as kind of merely, in a way, the um, in terms of um, you know uh, propriety or proximity or neighborhood, or, you know, these kind of you know implicitly you know kind of uh, xenophobic tropes, which kind of vitiate metaphysical humanism. Um, are successfully kind of, um, you know, overcome or can only be successfully overcome in, you know, through an, uh, an engagement with Marx's work and, and Marx's, and basically through a, an appreciation of the way in which the critique of political economy, in a way, is the, um, the materialist alternative to the critique of metaphysics. Um, and um, so the, and also, so that's the, you know, the kind of the, the conclusion of, of the paper is that there's something that has to be, that ought to be revisited. The claim, you know, the relegation of Marx to the kind of, uh, you know, the history of metaphysics, the claim that kind of, um, that the figure of the human in, in, in Marx can be kind of, uh, you know, straightforwardly aligned with, you know, familiar metaphysical conceptions of the human uh, is actually um, mistaken and uh, needs to be kind of, uh, you know, I think rejected. And that's, uh, so that's, you know, the work I'm currently engaged in. Um, so there's, um, okay. Now the next, okay, it's, I think I've been talking for about 15 or just over 15 minutes. Okay, so um, what's on the handout here is a kind of, um, there's a couple of, you know, points in the paper that I'm, you know, revisiting or, or wanted to expand. And one is, um, in a way, the, uh, as I said, because, you know, I take Deleuze and Guattari's work to be, in a way, that the most sophisticated uh, exemplar of this kind of, uh, of the attempt to, um, you know, the, uh, the, the metaphysical subversion of humanism. Um, I wanted to examine their accounts of capital, uh, especially in Anti-Oedipus, um, and um, show how, or, you know, kind of, point out bits that, um, in a way, by way of kind of, um, you know, ratifying the, uh, the critical account provided in the paper, which doesn't, you know, go into details, but actually the, I think the details are, are important. Um, but um, I'll just go through quickly these four pages on, on this handout. So one, the first, here's a, a quotation from um, Adorno, um, which is the idea that, um, the claim that humanity already exists, okay, the, the presumption of kind of, uh, of bourgeois positivism um, is precisely, um, you know, the claim in a way that, that Marx, I think, or that a kind of a philosophical reading of Marx should, should reject. And it's, it's the one that Benjamin and, and Adorno rejected. Um, they write, so this is, this is from Adorno's um, 1962 essay on progress, included in the Critical Models um, collection. So it's a really, I'll, I'll read out the whole quote because I think it's, it's, it's really uh, important. In Benjamin, progress obtains legitimation in the doctrine that the idea of the happiness of unborn generations, without which one cannot speak of progress, inalienably includes the idea of redemption. This confirms the concentration of progress on the survival of the species. No progress is to be assumed that would imply that humanity in general already existed and therefore could progress. Rather, progress would be the very establishment of humanity in the first place, whose prospect opens up in the face of its extinction. And this entails, as Benjamin further teaches, that the concept of universal history cannot be saved. 
It is plausible only as long as one can believe in the illusion of an already existing humanity, coherent in itself and moving upward as a unity. If humanity remains entrapped by the totality it itself fashions, then as Kafka said, no progress has taken place at all, while mere totality nevertheless allows progress to be entertained in thought. And this can be elucidated more simply by the definition of humanity as that which excludes absolutely nothing. If humanity or a totality that no longer held within it any limiting principle, then it would also be free of the coercion that subjects all its members to such a principle and thereby would no longer be a totality, no force unity. So this is an extremely interesting claim because I think what, um, I mean, I take, I take it that Adorno, um, I take Adorno to be saying um, that uh, in a way the capital as the, uh, you know, the integrating universal history only becomes possible um, with the advent of, you know, of capital, the, um, you know, the, the integration of uh, the entirety of, uh, of humanity um, under the, uh, into the capitalist mode of production. So in other words, all these otherwise disparate cultures, traditions, ways of life are now uh, violently kind of uh, subordinated to the reproduction of capital. Um, and, you know, the, uh, the whole of, um, you know, vast, you know, as, as empirical research shows, um, there are no more human beings who, you know, depend on selling their labor power for survival than ever before in history. So the key claim being that uh, Marx's concept of the proletariat is not uh, the concept of actually employed wage labor of the working class. It's precisely simply the proletariat for Marx is simply uh, the class of all those who are reduced to being mere bearers of labor power. In other words, all those humans um, whose uh, condition of existence is that of managing to sell their labor power to capital. Um, and Marx's whole point is that this capital, uh, the dynamic of capital is such that in reproducing itself and in kind of, uh, you know, maximizing surplus value, capital, you know, uh, you know, creates this, you know, reserve army of the unemployed. It creates unemployment um, so that um, as more and more human beings become dependent on selling their labor power, fewer and fewer human beings are able to do so. Um, hence, you know, kind of uh, intensifying immiseration. Um, so um, this totality, in other words, the totality, um, humanity is constituted, humankind is constituted through the capital relation, through its kind of forcible conscription uh, into the uh, you know the this kind of reserve reserve army of uh, of labor, um, and this means that um, human beings can only um, reproduce themselves um, and identify themselves you know as human through this um, you know by through their incorporation into the reproduction of this totality of the, of, uh, of capital as totality. Um, and it's this, um, that is the, you know, so in other words, all the kind of, uh, the, um, the antagonisms, every form of, you know, kind of social, you know, anthropological, uh, political antagonism, um, is, you know, on this, at this kind of uh, level of abstraction can be seen to be rooted in the, um, you know, the, the compulsion 
um, to reproduce oneself under the capital relation. Um, and it's this in a way that, um, you know, the, the boundary between the human and the non-human is in a way effectively um, enforced by, um, by capital. Um, yet at the same time, it's, um, you know, it forces human beings to self-identify um, by um, contributing to this, you know, uh, the, the reproduction of the totality that um, forces them to, in a way that also kind of um, turns them into selves because the, um, I think that one of the arguments that, that sorry, I don't know, Horkheimer making dialectic enlightenment is that, uh, you know, the, the condition of the, uh, uh, insofar subjectivity as self-preservation, uh, you, know, you know, the identity prin principle um, is, um, you know, this self-preservation as condition of harmonization is this uh, negative, um, you know, image of, of humanity, which cast by the, um, you know, the, the reign, the kind of the, the sovereignty of capital. Um, so the, only by abolishing this, you know, this bad totality, this, this kind of, um, this bad um, mode of integration and homogenization of the human, um, can um, humanity be instituted? Hence, you know, this is why um, human history has not yet begun on this on this account um, so that so then that this resonates i think so this resonates with the claim made by people by bradotti that humanism at least bourgeois humanism is necessarily exclusionary and the divisions between you know um, human castes um, are simply kind of exacerbations of the fundamental division between the human and the and the animal um, but the claim would be that um, the only proper way of overcoming this compulsory kind of um, you know, separation or division between the, uh, the human and the non-human, in, in other words, the division that is compelled by the imperative of self-preservation um, is um, the, uh, the abolishing of the antagonistic totality. Um, and here, although Adorno can be interpreted in different ways, but I think, you know, that this still means, you know, on the uh, abolishing capital um, so as to bring about um, a mode of, um, so as to abolish the conditions under which human beings um, can only live, can only exist together um, as uh, as egos or as subjects, um, you know, in uh, pitted against one another in uh, antagonistic relations. Um, so, in other words, the claim would be that there's a, what we need is a kind of a, a materialist, um, you know, a materialist kind of, um, you know, uh, foundation or, or rather materialist underwriting for the um, the claim that um, um, humanity would only begin once human beings were no longer compelled to differentiate themselves from the non-human or from the other. Um, but the conditions for the lifting of this injunction, you know, this injunction to self-preservation and to kind of, uh, you know, self-differentiation um, require, you know, a radical, a complete kind of, you know, reconfiguration of social relations. Um, okay. Um, that's the kind of, um, so in other words, when I say, uh, at the end of the essay, um, at the end of the, the paper, there's a kind of, um, you know, a re-examination of the claim that, um, you know, what, what marks, you know, the, uh, communism for Marx uh, entails 
the uh, or can only be the transition to communism can only be brought about through the domination of domination okay um, because domination can't be abolished by fiat um, and in a way i take transcendence um, you know to be kind of a, a cipher for domination whatever is transcendent is whatever is um is uh, you know the power to which human beings um, are subject and which they cannot and which they have to somehow accommodate themselves to um, and um, the I take Marx's claim to be that this uh, that transcendence you know once we understand the material and social mechanisms through which kind of transcendence is uh, perpetrating the you know the transcendence of capital just being the most you know with the most um, intimate but yet at the same time invisible placeholder for kind of divine transcendence um, we um, we have to um, learn to, you know we can only free ourselves by dominating domination um, now Adorno, I think, rejects this because he thinks that the, the attempt to dominate domination, the dictatorship of the proletariat, leads to totalitarianism, reinstates the totality. And um, actually, Mo Moish Pastone has a very interesting um, critical diagnosis of, of, the, um, uh, of the, you know, the, the origin of this premise in uh, the, the work of Friedrich Pollock, Adorno's um, colleague in the, uh, the Institute for Social Research. Um, and Pollock famously, um, you know, Pollock's analysis of monopoly capitalism uh, ultimately concluded that um, uh, the, in the early 20th century, um, what happens is that the um, both American style capitalism and to a lesser extent, kind of, um, you know, Soviet socialism were attempts to um, supersede distribution um, through the market by distribution by the state. Um, and the state's commandeering of distribution, in a way, um, cancelled the contradiction between uh, forces of production and relations of production, which Marx took to be the kind of the dynamic propelling, um, you know, the, the historical, the unfolding of the historical dialectic. Um, and so such that according to, Paul, to, to Pollock, the, uh, you know, the management of the economy, um, the state management of the economy, um, you know, secured the primacy of politics over economics at the price of any kind of, you know, uh, structural contradiction um, at, at the price of the fundamental um, antagonism of class, um, antagonism between kind of bourgeoisie and proletariat. Um, and this is why, um, and it's this, it's Pollock's account of the, uh, in a way, the, the defanging or the neutralizing of the revolutionary potency of the proletariat, um, which is the condition for Adorno's kind of claim that, you know, Capital is is no is no longer a contradictory totality. It's a kind of there are antagonisms. There are social antagonisms. Um, there are antagonisms of power. But these antagonisms um, are are being managed and assuaged um, in a way which precludes the possibility of any kind of revolutionary rupture or break. Um, and this is. Why um, you know the prospect of uh, so you know domination is now kind of definitively installed, and um, the um, the traditional kind of schema according to which you know this domination could be you know overcome um, through the kind of uh, the proletarian appropriation of the means of production no longer holds. So in other words, there is no way to, there's no kind of, um, there's no way to dominate domination that doesn't kind of simply kind of perpetuate this bad totality. Um, and one, 
you know, I think that the reason I'm, I'm very interested in Lukash's work is that I think that Lukash's account of um, the dynamic of, um, you know, the, the becoming subject of substance, the, the subjectivation uh, of, of labor um, still is, um, is the only way through which totality can be abolished um, and this um, you know, non-coercive, non-exclusionary humanity, this communist humanity could be definitively or, you know, instated. Um, um, actually, um, yes, and I'm just going to kind of skip to the end. Um, I, I'm going to, there are passages on Tozen Guattari, but that just kind of, I think, lead us down a rabbit hole and um, probably not lead us to a kind of, I mean, I'm happy to kind of discuss them, but in a way, like if I, I'm not going to kind of get out, if I start talking about that now, I, I won't get anywhere and I'll just kind of get lost. So I'll just conclude what I'm saying now with this um, couple of quotations from Postone. Um, Here's these two quotes from this 1982 essay by Postone and Barbara Brick, um, which is precisely about um, uh, Pollock's influence on, uh, um, on the Frankfurt School. Um, Marx, in other words, did not treat labor as the substance of a subject prevented by capitalist relations from realizing itself. Instead, he analyzed those relations themselves as constituting the subject, capital, whose substance is abstract labor, that is the specific character of labor as a medium of social interaction in capitalism. The notion that capital is the total subject indicates that for Marx, the end point of its development is not the realization, but the abolition of the totality. The character of its basic contradiction is therefore different than is the case with Hegel. It does not simply drive the unfolding of the totality forward, but points towards it. Um, so this is very, so Postone explicitly rejects the Lukashian account whereby once labor recognizes itself, you know, once labor recognizes that it is the self alienated subject, um, you know, um, which, um, you know, stands against it, uh, which, um, which capital as object, um, against which capital as object um, is juxtaposed, once labor realizes that it is the substance of value, and that value is nothing but, you know, um, you know objectified labor, uh, in a way, then you know um, labor can become subject once again can reclaim you know can in a way uh, reappropriate this expropriated kind of uh, social wealth uh, such that communism would be you know the uh, the realization or the coming to itself of labor okay this this is like a familiar kind of you know metaphysical scheme um, according to Postone's interpretation of Lukács. Um, so here, in, in a way, because capital is the totality, the only way uh, that totality can't be abolished, it's simply about you know, overcoming um, the subject that animates the totality, uh, you know, the synthesizing principle um, that generates this kind of uh, self-objectification of the totality, can recognize itself, uh, and, you know, um, realize itself, realize itself as uh, a good totality. Um, now, Postone's claim is rather that because subject, because um, capital as automatic subject um, entails that abstract labor um, is already, um, you know, subsumed by value, um, such that the, um, the abolition of value is the self-abolition of labor. And the self-abolition of labor is 
uh, detotalizing is also the abolition of the totality. Um, so this is why um, the points, the uh, communism for, for Pastone is not about the kind of uh, the accomplishment or the fulfillment or the returning to, to itself of labor, but simply about the self-abolition of labor and therefore the abolition of, of the identity of subject object. Um, you know, as uh, you know, com compacted in capital. Um, the problem, as I see it, is that there is no theory of the subject, in, or I might be wrong about this, but I think that um, it's not clear how, um, how this self-abolition can proceed, okay? The, how, how exactly does labor abolish itself? Um, it's not... In Pastone, I think that's a kind of, um, well, it seems to be a kind of a, um, an, a problem or lacuna in kind of um, Pastone's account. Um, and in a way, if, um, I mean, just to conclude Pastone's thought, this is why, according to, to Pastone, Marx's analysis um, could paradoxically get beyond the limits of the existence of the present totality only by limiting itself historically. The indication of the ultimate historicity of the object of thought implies the historicity of the thought itself that grasps it, that grasps the object. In other words, according to, to Pastone, um, it's precisely because um, once one, you know, um, once one understands that labor is a historically specific category, it's not a kind of a trans-historical category. There is no critique of capital from the vantage of of labor, but that labor itself is you know a shadow cast by value or internal to um, capital's kind of you know self reproduction uh, then the categories through which one diagnoses this this kind of uh, this process of kind of reproduction the kind of uh, you know the int you know the entwined reproductions of labor and capital um, means that um, the you know the category of totality is also historically specific, along with the, you know, the categories of subject, object, you know, labor and capital, um, and the successful um, you know, abolition of the social relation fueling um, those you know, entwined cycles of reproduction would also um, abolish totality, but, but in ways in which we can't foresee from the, you know, you know, from within the kind of, uh, you know, the, the circumscription of totality. Um, so in a, in a, this is why um, it's precisely by, you know, the historicity of the object of thought, i.e. kind of, you know, value or capital as totality and a, as self-reproducing subject um, implies that the, um, the critical categories through which we, um, you know, we diagnose and kind of examine uh, these um, the mechanisms of um, capital's reproduction um, point to a kind of um, you know the possibility of a kind of a, of a detailed totalization. You know, the abolition of value would be the kind of the abolition of the social totality, but in ways what well, in ways which can't be project no which can't be programmatically determined uh, at least for the time being and with consequences um, also that are you know that can't be anticipated in advance in other words the the um, the non-exclusionary humanity the, the humanity the institution of humanity with the abolition of uh, the capitalist totality um, the humanity that is, um, you know, no longer compelled to reproduce itself um, competitively, and you know, according to the kind of the, the form of the self and of of the subject, um, is are uninvisible, you know, from the um, from you know the current standpoint, and this means that although um, Weirdly, although 
you know, I think Postone criticizes, you know, Adorno's critical pessimism, the claim that kind of um, there is no, um, in a way that, um, that critical self-consciousness can only posit a transcendent exteriority in the form of, you know, something like redemption, you know, the right state of things, which cannot be positively characterized, but must be kind of somehow kind of salvaged, um, you know, as, you know, the, the, the possibility of things being otherwise. He thinks that there is, um, um, you know, we, ha we can, you know, concretely, um, diagnose um, you know the what it is that needs to be abolished um, and we can understand the conditions that the, the specificity of and in a way in the kind of um, the finitude of the uh, the mode of production uh, that's you know, enforces this kind of, uh, this coercive totalization on human beings. Um, but still, um, again, the, um, there's no kind of root to the domination of domination, or, or it's not clear how, how value can be abolished. Um, and these are, so this is the, um, in a way, these are, I take these to be the Marxian ramifications, um, you know, of the, um, you know, the uh, the problem, you know, um, which is which I I was trying to kind of um, you know diagnose at the, at the in the conclusion of this of this paper. So that's what the direction in which this work is moving is um, an attempt, in a way, to accept. The claim that um, you know the the critical claim that um, there's one you know there's a kind of a naive conception of the dialectic of labor and capital which is not viable once one understands the, the significance of um, the role of abstract labor in Marx's account of social domination. Um, and yet, at the same time, that there must be a way of, there must be an, an, an alternative mode of subjectivation. Um, otherwise, it's very difficult to see how, how anything can be abolished. Um, so, um, yeah, I'll stop there. And then, you know, there's, you know, I hope we can discuss like, um, other issues about you know humanism and post-humanism, but yeah, I think yeah, I think I've said enough, so I'll just stop there. Um. Yes, thank you very much. Yes, I'm I'm also interested um, exactly about how you think this um, let's say um, abolition of totality Adorno is is thinking about. I mean, um, when you read Marx um, strictly. Um, the, 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 the basic thought would be um, there is not only labor in, in, uh, included in the, in the value form, there's also reproductive labor. And this reproductive mm -hmm. labor is, of course, necessary in order to reproduce um, um, labor included in the value form, but it has not the, sh the shape of the value form. So this is what Nancy Fraser and also Luxembourg already addressed very, very um, strictly in saying, if we want to think social totality through the um, 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 value, value form, we have to think something which is not fully integrated in the value form. And of course, mm -hmm. Marx in, in this later chapters in, in, the, in, the, in the first, book of the capital says that this reproductive labor not included in the value form is more and more destructed. He says destruct, des destroyed and destructed. And this is very interesting because this would mean that um, this um, reproductive um, um, work, um, which is const a constitutive element for the reproduction of the labor um, as an abstract labor in the value form um, is in a certain way, um, um, yes, yes, there is at least a tension destructing also the labor um, 
the reproduction for the labor included in the value form. And maybe this is um, at least the form um, or a point of crisis where we are not sure whether labor can reproduce through the value form or not. Mm. And maybe this would mm -hmm. be a, the turning point. So um, I think if you stress so much with, with Adorno um, to this um, point where something cannot be in included in the totality um, anymore, and I think there you're right, um, you have to, to describe this in this tension between reproductive labor um, and labor um, um, included in the, uh, in the value form. I guess. Yes. Um, no. I, I, uh, thanks. Uh, that's very helpful. Uh, I agree. I guess. I mean. Look. I mean. I think. You know. In a way. One of the things. That I'm. You know. My hunches or kind of um, inclination is to think that. There's something about the distinction between living and dead labor in Marx, which has to be, which can be salvaged, um, or that that's re it's really important to salvage, um, and it can be salvaged without kind of, um, in a way, you know, hypostatizing living labor as this trans-historical constant or force, you know, or like you know, living labor as you know as as the human essence, um, and um, you know, so Marx, in a way, so what I want to examine or consider is um, if, um, and I think this is like, again, this I think what is really powerful, I think, or kind of uh, in Lukash, and it's, 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 a, it's a thought that is, I think, implicit, it's not maybe fully in, in, uh, unpacked, but it's implicit in Lukash's account um, that, um, you know, living labor is, you know, mortifies itself as, as dead labor kind of, you know, so exchanges its labor power, you know, is constantly kind of um, um, selling its labor power to the capitalists in order, in order to to stay alive in order to kind of, you know, to reproduce itself. Um, but I think there's an ambiguity between what, what is it that, um, or at least I haven't, you know, I, I need to kind of, to read more Marx to, to get a firm, to understand this is that it seems that it can be understood in two senses. There's the reproduction of labor power and the reproduction of living labor. Um, and on one, on the one hand, um, you know, it's not clear whether. No, wait. I, I take it that the problem is that is that living labor can only reproduce itself by reproducing its labor power, okay? Which is it's you know it's kind of it's dead, objectified kind of form. Um, but the question is whether it's possible to kind of to to positively characterize. The um, you know the characteristics of uh, of living labor, you know the as um, you know modes of activity um, that don't in, in a way that don't simply reduce to um, you know to, to to simple reproduction, okay because if um, so long as living labor is just reproducing itself, you know, um, you know, through the auspices of, of reproducing its labor power, then it, it is still kind of, it still exists as this mere bearer, this kind of life support system for labor power. And that's the, the, the condition of degradation, you know, uh, uh, that I, Marx is kind of uh, attacking. Um, so, um, I guess the, um, I think there's something, yeah, this is what I'm trying to kind of, um, there's something that is, you know, there's a condition for the whole kind of, you know, 
valorization process for the kind of the creation of surplus value that remains, um, you know, that is necessarily kind of omitted or, or excluded. Um, but the problem is that any kind of preemptive positive characterization of living labor as this, as a kind of, um, as a force, a power, an energy, I think draws one back into a kind of metaphysics of labor, okay, which is, I think, um, precisely the kind of, uh, you know, the, the naive kind of um, positivization of labor that kind of Pastone and others are, are, are attacking. So, um, so yeah, so I think, I mean, so what you just, what you asked is, is crucial. Um, I see, look, I mean, it's, the point is that human beings, you know, you know, the value form can be, you know, can obviously be destroyed. Like if, if uh, a meteorite kind of, you know, crashes into the planet, like, you know, and wipes out, you know, most of humanity, like, yeah, that would, that would end the value form. Okay. Um, but that's not, you know, you know, the, the abolition of the value form can't just take this kind of, you know, some kind of pestilence, you know, could wipe it out, you know, but that's not the end of capital that kind of Marx has in mind. So the question is like, if human beings end it on their own terms, collectively, um, they can't just do it because under the negative constraints um, that it's, um, as you say, that it's, uh, it's killing them because it's making it, you know, more and more impossible for them to kind of, uh, you know, to, to succeed, to stay alive, okay? Um, and I think that the, um, you know, this is why I think that the kind of, um, this is why I think it's a mistake to, you know, if, if, if you just understand living labor as just kind of, uh, you know, biological kind of survival, that would be a terrible kind of, you know, you know, a dangerous kind of, you know, reduction, I think. Uh, so, yeah, so this is what, I mean, I'm, I don't know what to say about this, or I haven't, but it's, this, this is kind of what I'm um, trying to kind of figure out. Um, in other words, to, to, to find a way to salvage some kind of agency uh, in living labor, um, capable of kind of, you know, of carrying out this kind of uh, the abolition, you know, capable of, of, of executing the self-abolition, um, but in ways which don't, you know, in a way which wouldn't involve a kind of uh, some, which wouldn't positively valorize kind of, um, you know, um, anthropological attributes, you know, talk about kind of these kind of anthropological invariants that are kind of, you know, that are, you know, that humanity must kind of um, continue or must kind of extend into the future or simply kind of, or resorting to some kind of, you know, negative mystical residue, so some ineffable kind of, you know, um, creative force. Um, so, yeah, so I don't, I don't really know what's, you know, I haven't gotten any further with this. Um. Thanks a lot, Ray. Um, so, yeah, there seems to be also a problem that um, you're still kind of um, st struggling with in your incredibly um, illuminating and rich um, concrete and thought, um, concrete and act as well. Um, and yeah, the the value idea specifically. Um, I know you um, mentioned the um, you, you, you've written about the essay when Bradnam first introduces the idea of um, magnanimity, um, which you don't um, sort of um, directly write about. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure if you um, had time to read. Um, spirit of trust where he's sort of um, building up to his attempt to kind of think about um, uh, this question but sorry to make it more concrete 
Um, there's a few words that you um, mentioned but don't um, flesh out too much, which for me feel like some of the answers um, to this. So one thing Brandon does really well is have this really impressive system um, that helps us to make sense of all kind of stuff. But um, and at the heart of that are theories of the social. And um, like without the social, his theories are nothing, but he doesn't really explain what um, social practices are properly. Um, I, again, um, every time I'll cheerlead for them, um, what the school of Vygotsky and Ilyankov are focused on is precisely to um, flesh out the social. Um, and every time, like every time I see Marx mentioning um, species being, we've got a few key words, it seems, that they talk about that I haven't really, uh, I don't really see within your account. Um, and the way that um, Vygotsky and Ilyankov separate between um, um, value and valorization and value as in um, what we find um, in our experience and what we might find should we um, escape that is in terms of in them the related concepts of um, sociality, imagination and um, universality. So you've got a quote in Marx like um, so he's, he's, he's got some quite um, th there's this amusing one. I'm initially wholly abstract, completely indeterminate. I, thus standing open to all content whatever, um, in so far as I am this, I can make for myself the emptiest representations. Take myself, for example, to be a dog. In fairy tales, um, humans have indeed been transformed into dogs. Or imagine um, I am um, to fly. Only the human gets as far as grasping himself in this complete abstraction of the eye. Um, it, it, I, I picked a simplistic one just because obviously I'm reading it out loud, but yeah, um, I feel like there's, there's sort of dozens of quotes where um, he introduces species being, and then straight away we've got imagination, um, and we've got a particular definition of um, universality, and then we get sociality. Um, and um, I'm sort of getting to a synthesis of what you're writing and Vygotsky and Elienkov, but I'm surprised that um, I haven't seen in your own work, um, well, um, maybe I haven't read it carefully enough, um, talk about this. Like you, you, um, you obviously, finish your piece on Prometheanism with the point that, um, which, which is almost identical to Vygotsky, that um, reason structures imagination, but can also remake its limits. Um, like, I feel like that's the crux of it. Um, so, so yeah, um, that, that's all various things. Sorry, that was a bit fragmented. Well, um, no, again, it's a, uh... So I guess, I mean, um, so you're asking if, you know, why isn't there something more to be said about, uh, I mean, don't we already have some resources to positively characterize, you know, human um, you know, species being as you could, or, or genus being, you know, Gethunsvesen. Um, um, yeah, this is so, okay. I mean, in Marx, yes, there, is, there are, you know, and the uh, the kind of uh, you know manuscripts from the forties, you know, and uh, yeah, mainly kind of the economic philosophical manuscripts. When he's talking about, um, you know, when yeah, when he's discussing human genus being, um, you know, he says um, we can. Um, well, he talks about it at the level of of self-consciousness and the way in which we, you know, um, human beings relate to themselves 
um, uh, through the the genus. Okay, through this. Uh, um, I can't remember the exact. Uh, I need to reread it to, to remember the exact formulation. But um, that still sounds quite close to kind of you know to f the far back in account um, of you know human genus being in terms of you know, the kind of uh, the universality, the unboundedness of human self-consciousness, the human beings, the human self-consciousness is, you know, this kind of, uh, you know, this autonomous, um, you know, uh, self, you know, or potentially self-determining, you know, creative potency. Um, and in a way, all of which, you know, I'm inclined to kind of, to, you know, to, to embrace and endorse, but then, you know, the, uh, you know, I take it that, you know, in Marx's critique of Feuerbach, he's saying that, look, the point is that um, the social relation, you know, I'm, I might be wrong about this, but like the way I, you know, I understood Marx's critique of Feuerbach was that Feuerbach unpacks the social relation at the level of, of self-consciousness is a relationship between two self-consciousnesses, you know, what he calls the absolute relation. Um, and this is still too Hegelian because it means that the social relation is still kind of, it's not intersubject, it's kind of interpersonal, you know, this a form of the kind of I thou relation. Um, I mean, not unlike Brandom, you could say, at the heart of kind of Brandom's account of sociality is the, the I thou relation. Um, and Marx, says that this is um, um, no the, the what conditions um, you know, this I thou relation you know the uh, the re you know the kind of the desire for mutual recognition that animates self consciousnesses is determined by conditions of uh, reproduction you know of collective um, interdependence uh, and collective material reproduction, which operate in a way behind the back of um, self-consciousness. And that's, and that's why you can't, um, in a way, that's why sociality is opaque, or, or at least, you know, on this reading, it's, it's, it's opaque to self-consciousness. Um, but also it's kind of, it's, it's precondition. Um, and then then the, you know the kind of um, you know the, the worry would be that you know any kind of um, you know the you know, if consciousness is determined by kind of social being that even you know any kind of identification um, of you know the the positive capacities of human self consciousness you know its imaginative capacities its rational capacities etc cetera, etc. Cetera, um, still kind of, um, you know, is, is in danger of, well, um, ignoring the kind of the, the division of labor, you know, division of manual and intellectual labor, um, because the, um, you know, the, the risk is of segregating these positive anthropological characteristics within the dimension of self-consciousness and therefore, um, you know, not uh, being blind to, um, you know, you know, kind of automated, you know, unself-conscious, um, you know, reflexes, habits, automatisms um, that you know uh, allow, you know, or or condition this uh, this self-consciousness, um, and. Okay, I mean, to which, so I would say, like, I don't want to, I think it's a mistake to say that, um, you know, I want to be able to say something positive about, and, you know, when Marx, the young Marx talks about free conscious activity as being what, you know, must be realized in, uh, in the human, um, I take it um, this cuts across the division between intellectual and manual labor. So free conscious activity, 
could be um, any kind of activity, whether kind of, you know, could, you know kind of cognitive, or rather, I mean, the point is that you wouldn't need to kind of to separate, you know, the kind of uh, the cognitive and the practical anymore. Um, and yeah, you wouldn't distinguish the contempt, you know, the contemplative from the, um, you know, from the practical effective. Um, but it's difficult for us right now to kind of, um, you know, to see how, you know, to positively characterize the possibilities of free conscious activity that would open up um, because our, um, our catalog of these capacities is still kind of historically kind of, you know, constrained. Um, I don't know, maybe this is wrong. Maybe, maybe this is a kind of, you know, an excessive anxiety about kind of, um, you know, transgressing the kind of, you know, the, the prohibition on historical specificity that, you know, there's any kind of, you know, that all the categories, you know, even the abstract categories that you kind of, you, you deploy, you know, are, are still kind of, you know, um, specific, kind of historically specific. And in a way, I don't want to, again, I think that that's probably kind of going too far. But it, yeah, I can't think, to be honest, like I don't have a good answer because I don't know um, I mean, look, if you're talking about imagination, you know, you're talking about a psychological category. And then the question is, um, you know, what's, um, well, um, you know, what allows us to be kind of, you know, to say that these these are the fundamental kind of um, modalities um, or you know capacities of of the human mind. Um, and, and just, just a super quick um, reply. Um, all of that is at the level of idealism. And what if we put stuff back in? I'm not sure. And um, to stop, if I stop going on about um, how Ilyenko and Vygotsky do it, which they do, if we put stuff back in as like um, have you read John Hoagland, um, Truth and Rule Following? If we do the same, but it's through the actual dialectic of the material conditions of the contour of the actual world, rather than the sort of just um, random um, reasons, reasons, and reasons thing, um, mm -hmm. that feels like what, um, well, is what I'm currently um, reading you as saying, or although you're... Um, um, not saying it, but surely what, what's missing from everything you've said is that it's materialism that's the difference between um, the pitfalls that you've mentioned and the reality. Sorry, I, I, I won't um, interrupt this. Okay, no, that's that's that. No, that's uh, that's great. I haven't read that Hogelin piece, but I will. And uh, no, I mean it's. Um, yeah, no, I mean, it's, uh, it sounds like, uh, yeah, um, what you say sounds right. So, um, yeah, no, I'll, I'll definitely kind of, and I still haven't read, you know, Ilyenkov and um, Vygotsky, I'm afraid. I mean, I've, I've got the Ilyenkov. Um, I started, I've just started reading it, but I haven't gotten very far. And, um, but yeah, obviously I will um, follow up on this because it's, you know, it's really, um, well, from what you've just said, it's kind of crucial. So for what I'm trying to to work out. So yeah, so thanks. Okay, I'll, I'll definitely, I'll take this recommendation on board. Um. Hi, um, I've got a question about Derrida and Hegel, because I, I was fascinated, Ray, by your suggestion um, that In a sense, Derrida's reading of of of, of Hegel um, as, if you like, a, a presentist thinker leaves leaves him in a kind of double bind. That is a sort of equivocation. 
between absence and presence or, or kind of some kind of radical alterity that can't be in a sense compact. And I, I'm just interested in exploring, I guess, a different path out of that impasse. And, and, and really it's a kind of, and, and this is quite speculative. I, 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 I really need to read, I'm, I'm, kind of, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of diving into Hegel a lot at the moment because it's a gap in my philosophical education. So this is super speculative. However, it might go something like this. I, I, I think you, you, you certainly can read deconstruction in terms of this sort of perpetual equivocation that, 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 that you know, I think as you rightly say is, is epistemologically unsatisfactory for all sorts of reasons. A different way perhaps of taking Derrida would be to say that, say his, 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 his deconstruction of various kind of figures within the tradition, Husserl, or Kant, or whatever, are in a way doing a bit like what, um, what Badiou is doing in the history of philosophy. That is in a sense unbinding or untethering the kind of constitutive efficacy of these systems. So that, for example, according to Derrida, and this is kind of my reading, if it comes to Derrida on Husserl, what Husserl tells us is that if phenomenology is anything like what phenomenology, what, what he says phenomenology is, then phenomenology can't tell us what phenomenology is. That is, it's constitutively mm. incomplete. So that you could see what Derrida's doing as a kind of um, uh, a kind of scholarization of philosophy. That is, for any particular system, he's telling us he's giving us reasons why that system can't, in a sense, constrain the very thing that it's purporting to constrain. Mm -hmm. Then it follows, perhaps, what, how he, one could respond to your point about Hegel is that, yeah, for both Derrida and Hegel, there's a kind of model of, if you like, self-differing, difference or self-differing. But Hegel's self-differing, in a sense, still operates within the space of reasons, in a sense between, in, the te if, in, in a sense, in the, the, the tension between understanding and, and, and reason in, in, in this kind of perpetual process of rational belief fixation. Whereas um, the kind of Derridian infrastructures like difference, iterability, a kind of if you like, they're, they're as Rodolf Gashley said, they're, they're, they're the kind of opaque underside, which in a sense can't be cashed out in terms of the space of reasons. So I think the Derridian response, perhaps, at least if I'm going by way of Derrida here, which is, I think, it's kind of a, 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 a post-humanist reading, but it's not a critical post-humanist reading is to suggest that what this suggests is, is actually a way of kind of blocking the kind of ascent to the meta level that's always implicit in the kind of dialectical thinking that's characteristic of um, Hegel and also the, the sort of Marxist response to Hegel. That is that we no longer have the ability to constrain the possibility space of subjectivity or agency and therefore the completion of history in humanity is in a sense voided because in a sense we're not in a position to to um, make any a priori claims about it from within our, our, our current historical situation so I, I guess my tentative response might be to suggest a kind of a different kind of post-humanist reading of this situation. Not, I, I can, I, I'm very sympathetic with your critique of critical post-humanism. I don't think post-humanism can give us an ethics. I think it's best read as a counter-ethical system rather along the lines that Claire Colebrook suggests. Um, but I think that, I, I think there's a way of fashioning an epistemological response to uh, 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 an epistemological account to support that 
which avoids the kind of epistemological equivocation of a certain kind of deconstruction, and that's at least allows a kind of more empirical approach as well to our current historical juncture. It doesn't simply, um, it doesn't simply kind of reduce um, deconstruction to negative theology, in other words. So, I mean, that's not really a question, it's a kind of tentative response, I guess, because I, 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 I'm trying to think this stuff through as well, and I, I've found your thoughts invaluably, valuably helpful, by the way. Thank you so much. Thanks, no thanks. That's, that's a very helpful um, comment. Um, yeah, I mean, Yeah, this this claim, or you know, your suggestion that it's uh, what Derrida is doing is, you know, I guess calling into question the um, the possibility of, um, you know, I guess of you know of um, the reflexive. Um, you know, the, the reflexive encompassing um, of the, um, you know, of the in itself, that whatever is kind of is opaque at one level of consciousness or one, one level of experience can be recuperated um, and either, you know, made explicit or kind of, um, you know, positively conceptualized at this kind of, you uh, at a higher level, or kind of, a, or, a, or a meta level, um, this is. I mean, I think that's a really good way of, you know, characterizing kind of Derrida's project. In a way, it makes me think of what, um, you know, there's a passage I quote um, in the essay from. Um, I think it's actually not, I'm not, I don't think it's not from the end, it's from Uziah and Grammy, another mm. kind of essay, an essay on kind of Heidegger and Aristotle from the, the same mm. book where Derda talks about or not a writing, um, but anyway, a kind of, um, you know, a writing without form, without, you know, he goes through this list of kind of, you know, this, uh, uh, this list of subtractions, a kind of, a, you know, a, a writing that could no longer be um, conceptually formed that there would no longer kind of accord with the catalog of conceptual forms provided by, I don't know, by metaphysics or, or whatever. Um, but then, you know, I think the problem is that the, um, look, the, the moment of, um, you know, that then the kind of, you know, the, the point I was trying to make is that this, um, I can't remember what I, actually I should look at what I said because I think it's kind of, it's relevant here uh, to this passage. Um, um, Probably got it in front of me. Is, um, I think it's on page 24, I think. Oh, in oh the, great. Okay. Yeah. If you have. Yeah. In uh, the, um, in, in the page 24 in the, um, uh, PDF, or 23 okay. to 24, sorry. Uh, Everything in Hegelianism that... ...receives the predicate of the Yes, church. um... Uh, But there's an also passage where Derrida is talking about the writing. Um, oh yeah. Uh, uh, it's uh, yes, it's on page uh, sorry twenty one, where he yeah. talks about uh, the reduction of meaning, which yeah, like, yeah. I'm completely sympathetic to. The reduction of meaning um, on the basis of a meaningless formal organization, a new writing yeah. um, uh, that would inscribe a difference still more on thought at the difference between being and beings, a writing without presence, without absence, without history, without cause, without archaea, without telos, a writing that absolutely upsets all dialectics, all theology, all teleology and all ontology. Well, um, 
Yes, I mean, the, the, as I mean, as Derrida well knows, and this is why the, the, this kind of rhetoric in Derrida is always puzzling because he himself knows full well that the reduction of form, there is no, you know, you can't, there's no absolute reduction of form. You need the resources of form to suspend form, you know, to interrogate form. Um, the, uh, and in a way, that's what I take him to be insisting upon is like, you know, it's, it's another way of saying that, you know, kind of, um, you know, the alterity, uh, you know, the suspension or the interruption of conceptual form, comprehension, um, you know, uh, reflexive recuperation of form, you know, needs, you know, can only be negotiated through this very kind of delicate operation. Um, and and so, I agree that it's very problematic. And, and as you rightly bring out, because Derrida sometimes talks about syntax in this yes, passage, um, but of course, you know, a kind of formal conception of syntax only makes sense within some kind of opposition between syntax and semantics and some kind of clear set of rules. Um, but as you, uh, you know, uh, and, uh, he makes a similar point, for example, in his reading of Mallarmé's uh, Mimique in the double session. Um, I, I, I guess I mean, I guess with you know within the concepts that he's bringing to bear on on, on the notion of form, I, I, I agree that that's extremely problematic. Um, he, he makes similar claims in relation to Bataille's um, work as well, um, and I, 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 I'm I, I'm I'm quite happy to admit that if you pursue that that line of that that approach that 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 sort of epistemology. You know that that, that you, you 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 relinquish certain kind of ontological and, and if you like formal guardrails. I mean, I think it's it, it it it's a problem I've been sort of working on as well. Um, I don't I don't know. At the same time, and I think I think I. Th I think the the question is whether there are kind of persuasive reasons to risk that 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 loss of bearings. You know, whether, I mean, I I think what what's interesting about Derrida is 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 not so much the the explicit claims about difference, but the the way that he gets there often by some actually quite consequential argument. You know, that there is actually some. You, you know, you can reconstruct those arguments. They do actually lead you somewhere, even where if, if, if where they lead you can at certain moments look like an impasse. So I, I'm not at all um, denying the, the sort of difficulty of that, 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 that in the sense of, the, of that juncture, you know, if we follow that, if you like, anti-Hegelian um, line. I, I mean, look, I'm just, I've just been struck by something, you know, in your, in your own work, I think you're, I mean, I agree with you about, you know, and I think what is, you know, persuasive in Derrida's critique of phenomenology is, you know, there, there is a kind of, you know, a myth of, you know, self-presence of, uh, you know, the, the fulfillment, you know, the, the coincidence of kind of um, intending and intended, you know, um, I think, and I, I, in your work, you, you know, in your own work, you've emphasized that there's something, you know, that there, the suggestion that there are structures that are, you know, necessarily opaque to, to kind of phenomenological reflection that cannot be recuperated. And I completely agree with that. But uh, I guess the disagreement is, is what consequences to draw from the critique yeah. of uh, of of self reflection, the idea that kind of you know consciousness can um, you know access um, these um, you know, its blind its blind spots, kind of opacities, etc. And actually, because I think you know my you know inclination is to say that uh, in a way the whole kind of Salarian critique of the framework of givenness. When he says that kind of um, you know the uh, the structures of uh, the structures that condition intending 
um, you know, and, and self-consciousness, et cetera, um, precisely cannot be accessed, but she, she's the screwing up of one's, you know, inner mental eye. In other words, there's a kind of, uh, there's a process of reflection, which is not phenomenological, which doesn't presuppose, in other words, it's a process of reflecting on the articulation of, in a way, the, um, the, uh, the infra and the meta level, okay? Yeah, um, I, I mean, sort of I, I, I agree with that, and I, and I think that I mean I think there is a there is a you know it, it is possible to pursue an analogous critique of that sort of Salazian line um, via sort of, I, I guess via you know thinking about rule following considerations, which I probably I mean I I tried to do that in some of my later work, but I, I mean I won't go through it here, but I, I mean you know that. that I, I don't think the failure of reflection has to be understood in purely phenomenological terms. Actually, even in Derrida's work, you know, obviously mm -hmm. with his speech act theory, and um, you know, there are, if you like, alternative lines of approach to reflexivity which are not exclusively phenomenological. But I, I, I don't want to go on too long because I think other people will want to come in but I, um, but anyway thanks for such a productive um sure i mean hopefully you know we can return you know later yeah i would love to do that yeah, yeah can, absolutely um, no it's, it's it's just kind of more than probably can be unpacked here in reasonable time okay okay thanks uh, ray yeah great thank thanks again um uh I should i read the question. um oh yeah okay yes sure sure Okay, um, my question concerns um, the conception of capitalism as a totality. For example, in accelerationism, they always stress that we should, um, for example, distinguish modernity and capitalism, and we should kind of disentangle them. And shouldn't we also try to disentangle capitalism from itself? So shouldn't we... Um, rather try to see it as different institutions, different techniques that interrelate and maybe we can maybe we can salvage some like money and labor and we have to discard others like um, competition. And so should, wouldn't be a more systems theoretic approach or understanding of capitalism, yeah be more productive maybe because otherwise if we want to conceptualize the the new society after capitalism we we have to re refer to some alterity and we never we never want to do this like some radical alterity that isn't um yeah that isn't conceptualizable um before before we get there or before we experience it okay thanks um Okay, um, yeah, so no, I realize this um, insistence that, you know, capital, well, I think, first of all, in, in a, you know, I'm, I'm following Marx here, I think there's, a, there's an important distinction between capital and capitalism. Um, and capital for Marx is both a social relation, it's a class relation, which divides, um, you know, proprietors, owners of the means of production from those who only own their, their labor power. And it's also a process, the valorization process, the kind of the constant um, expansion of surplus value. And those two, the, the, the process and the relation are kind of uh, intertwined in Marx's analysis. Um, you know, capitalism then would be the network um, of, you know, practices, um, you know, habits, um, cultural forms, etc., that are, in a way, conditioned and encompassed by this, you know, this relation and this process. Um, and the, the Marxian claim is, in a way, that this, you know, capitalism is this you know, Marx kind of, you know, analyzes the, these social forms, the commodity form, 
the money form, the value form, um, you know, along with a whole bunch of others, and shows how they kind of, in a way, they, those these social forms, you know, kind of which are interdependent and interlocking, um, and you know, uh, presuppose one another, in a way, condition all kind of, you know, all the social and cultural um, practices that human beings, you know, currently engage in. Um, so the word totality is not to be understood as a kind of hermetically see. It's, I think, you know, there's a useful distinction to make between a totality and a whole. Actually, Althusser makes this distinction, where a totality, and although, I mean, Althusser rejects the kind of, he thinks that Hegel kind of, you know, conflates these two, thinks, you know, thinks of the whole um, and the totality as kind of equivalent. Althusser will say, well, every, every totality is constituted by, um, you know, a point of an impossibility, something that is, um, that is kind of um, um, not positively inscribed within it. So in other words, that, that there is something, um, you know, what holds the, uh, what articulates the totality is something that, that is not itself, that can't be counted as an element of that totality. So there's a sense in which every totality is open and not closed in this sense. It's not, you know, to say that uh, a structure is totalizing is to say that this, it's a process of totalization, which is necessarily um, incomplete, which can't, because it would no longer kind of, it would detotalize the moment it kind of completed itself and turned into a whole, it would no longer be a totality. Um, and in a way, I think that Marx already, but what, what, when, when Marx says that capital is animated by this moving contradiction, the moving contradiction between, you know, the, um, you know, the, the imperative to kind of maximize surplus value um, while minimizing, you know, the, uh, you know, the necessary labor from which this surplus value is, is drawn. He also said this is a process which is tends towards a limit, but the limit is, can never be actually be reached. Okay, as capital reproduces itself, it reproduces the limit. And Deleuze and Guattari are right about, they, 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 they stress this aspect, but they're kind of faithful to, to Marx when they stress this aspect, that the um, capital, in reproducing itself, capital always kind of tends towards a point of disintegration, which it can never, you know, which is never kind of reached. Um, so in this sense, it's not possible, you know, to, in a way to, to abolish capital, it requires abolishing money and value. Um, and it's not, the problem then is to kind of, you know, to find a mode of, um, um, the question is how indispensable is, for instance, the money form um, to, you know, to human social reproduction. I mean, obviously, societies without money have existed, human societies without money have existed. But when Marx says that capital, that money is the kind of the, the self estranged manifestation of, um, you know, the, you know, the inexhaustible plasticity of human self consciousness, you know, M M Marx says, you know, money is this kind of um, money's capacity to commensurate incommensurables is exactly is is a kind of uh, is is an estranged um, you know manifestation of what is the uh, a characteristically human capacity. Um, so the point would be if we could regulate and coordinate our relations without with one another and find a medium of exchange that is no longer, uh, that no longer entails the, um, the estrangement um, of, uh, you know, of our own kind of, um, you know, metamorphic capacities. In other words, and actually Adorno says something in the same essay uh, I quoted from about this. He says that um, every, every form of exchange, you know, exchange has been, 
a, a constant of you know human societies um, you know magic and sacrifice are forms of exchange the the capitalist exchange abstraction is the is a, in a way a kind of a, the culmination of um, the uh, of this of the attempt to commensurate incommensurables okay but it Com but the way in which money commensurates incommensurables is um, by, um, in a way, subsuming, you know, by um, subsuming this commensuration to, you know, kind of this, uh, to value, to this kind of abstract uh, form. Um, which reproduces itself, you know, and in reproducing itself, um, you know, coordinates human relations through the money form in a way that inhibits and prevents the, um, you know, the, the expansion, the, you know, the, the, the realization of our kind of metamorphic capacities. So the point is that if you could decouple exchange from valorization, then, um, which, which means abolish the kind of, you know, because abolish, ab ab abolishing valorization also entails abolishing the capital relation, the class relation, means that human beings would be able to relate to one another and to exchange um, no longer on the basis or on the basis of, um, of needs that, that are no longer cur curtailed by scarcity. Okay, so human beings will be able to give to one another um, without, you know, um, you know, freely and um, gratuitously, without, um, you know, uh, in a way, kind of exacting, kind of, you know, some kind of compensation in return. It would be exchange without kind of compensation or a kind of, and that's, you know, that's what, um, you know. In order, so in order to have a society where human beings can relate to one another um, without competition, without domination, et cetera, et cetera, then you need to, um, you know, to have solved the, the problem of scarcity. So, you, know, you, you need to have abolished the material conditions which oblige human beings to kind of um, to compete for resources, you know, to kind of, uh, to compete with one another and to kind of, um, you know, to, to preserve themselves at the expense of others um, so that human beings then could relate to one another um, and exchange, but exchange without, um, you know, exchange without this exchange being subsumed by this transcendent social form, capital, um, which actually, um, um, yes, which um, turns money into a medium, into, into this universal equivalent um, by you know, systematically kind of um, you know, disabling um, the possibility of, of human beings um, being able to relate to one another um, without, you know, without either identifying um, or estranging one another. Um, okay, so that, that's very abstract, but it's a, it's a concrete point. Is that what does money do? Why is money necessary? Um, and, you know, the... I think... Um, I think Marx is right. I, I, you know, I believe Marx's account about that money is this kind of. Uh, this is why the the you know the invention you know the what money does under capitalism prefigures what human beings could do, you know, um, once they've kind of um, overcome capitalism and found a you know a way of um, establish a mode of kind of social coordinate social synthesis that doesn't um you know that doesn't require the uh 
the commensuration of their activities um, through this, um, you know, foreign medium or, th or through this kind of uh, alien medium. Um, and yeah, some people have, I mean, it's difficult to envisage from where we are because, I mean, in a way, it's so much of what we are and so much of how we conceive of ourselves is bound up with this, you know, historic, this mode of production that um, it's, uh, I think, it's not, it's not even as if you can, and here, like, you know, I'm, I'm you know, there was a time in which I thought like it was, um, you know, you, you mentioned the distinction between capitalism and modernity. And, um, you know, while on the one hand, I don't want to, you know, I think it's a mistake to identify capitalism with modernity and therefore to think that, you know, modernity has no, um, you know, that modernity must be abolished as well as capitalism. Um, but I, th I also think it's a mistake to think that, you know, what we call modernity or those institutions and practices that we identify as peculiarly modern um, already positively prefigure communism. I think that, you know, modernity is like the, you know, the medium through which, you know, we access communism, which would be, I mean, if, if the term wasn't already kind of fatally kind of poisoned, you know, by all its associations. I mean, actually, Brandom uses the term post-modernity and um, spirit of trust, because that he means what comes after modernity, which is, you know, the, um, the, the realization of the, uh, the promises that modernity can't keep, that, that modernity has to make but cannot keep. Um, so, yeah, I, do, I don't know if that's um, an answer, but... Um, it was, thanks. Okay. It was helpful. Um, there's, there's a question um, from Kyle. Um, sh should I read the question? Okay. Um, so Kyle writes, I'm curious about your use of the term generic in the human essay. Do you distinguish your use of this term from Larry and Babu? I'm curious about your thoughts on the attempts to decouple the formation of the human from the from the transcend from transcendence and animus metaphysics. Lastly, could you elaborate on your use of the prefix inhuman at the end of your essay? Um, yeah, yeah, obviously, the, yeah, the term generic is used by Badiou, but also by, by Larrell. And um, in a way, I was, you know, already kind of very interested in their use of the term, but then I think, again, that what Marx, in a way, um, Marx's point is that um, it's not enough. So, for instance, if one thinks of, you know, when, you know, when Badiou calls the human the voided animal, um, you know, the animal that is, uh, you know, you know, that is the bearer of capable of, you know, producing truths, and therefore the animal that can't be um, reduced to any kind of positive, any set of anthropological predicates. Um, I think the, the marching point is that those, um, I mean, in a way, the problem is, you know, the, uh, the process of, if the generic is produced by subtracting specific predicates, um, this process of subtraction remains you know, purely ideal um, unless one gives some account of you know, the, the social historical conditions um, which, um, you know, which generate, which make those uh, specific predicates um, effective or actual. So in other words, all the ways in which, um, you know, the, the human animal has been positively characterized and which are, you know, obviously are 
are exclusionary and involve kind of you know domination etc it's simply not enough one remains on the kind of uh, at the level of like you know ideal abstraction if one simply kind of um you know yes kind of distinguishes the generic from the specific conceptually and the point would be to show how you know i take this as marx's whole point is to show that human you know that all the specific predicates um that constrain you know the uh or that kind of the predetermine the um you know the the possibilities proper you know the pro possibilities kind of you know um char characteristic of the human um are generated um through real social you know uh, relations, you know, uh, because of, you know, um, material conditions of social reproduction. Um, and it's, it's, so in other words, you have to anchor the process of specification in the process of, you know, social reproduction, and then understand how the despecification must involve radical kind of social transformation. Um, so in other words, the, the I think that the um, um, the generic for Marx, the kind of um, the uh, the uh, the genericity of the human is uh, can only be you know properly understood via the critique of political economy and the uh, the process of you know social reproduction and so yeah and I think that's why i mean yeah i think i'm you know indebted to laruel and badiou um but i think their conceptions are they're still in this kind of almost um you know post hegelian their characterization of the generic is still kind of in this kind of pre-marxian kind of post hegelian moment um because they haven't identified this kind of uh the material kind of basis for the uh you know the, the the production of the generic um and then you also ask um about their attempts to decouple the formation of the human from transcendence and, and metaphysics uh yes i think to their, they there are two thinkers who are unwilling simply to kind of uh, in a way who also defend you know the genericity of the human from the claim that, the, you know, and from the Heideggerian claim, that humanism is just part of, um, is in league with metaphysics. So uh, what's interesting about, they, they both reject that kind of, you know, Heideggerian um, destitution of humanism as simply kind of, um, you know, a component of, of metaphysics. Um, and finally, you, Final part of your question is, um, could you elaborate on your use of the prefix inhuman at the end of your essay? Yeah, um, yeah, th I mean, the points, um, I was trying to, I mean, that was, um, in a way, that's a residue from a, a f an earlier version of this, of this paper, where there was an attempt to to talk about um, you know, social reproduction and libidinal repetition um, as these two, you know, um, you know, inhuman forces that condition the human. Okay, so that the, the inhuman within the human is reproduction and repetition. Um, and um, in a way, I still want to find a way. It's, it's a way of you know, avoiding to, to say that you know of avoiding the kind of the, the, the juxtaposition of the human and the non-human and with the whole point of saying that the human doesn't actually adorno's point that the human humanity doesn't has not been realized doesn't exist because it's not a natural kind is to say that the boundary between um you know the, the human and the non-human you know as currently drawn is um you know, is is not at all um, you know to be. Once you realize 
the conditions under which that kind of uh, the work that that kind of demarcation is doing. But the point is not simply to kind of um, to dissolve it. Is not simply to kind of abolish the boundary by metaphysical fiat, okay? Uh, and to say that um, we don't yet know what the human is because the conditions, um, yes, we don't yet know what it is. Therefore, we can't, we're not in a position to say what it is not. Um, okay, that's, I guess that's the best I can do um, in response to Kyle. Uh, Thank yes, you. I had a uh, question. Um, my question about the construction of a concept of, of humanity and uh, therefore concept of uh, totality. Uh, in uh, Gestalt psychology, there is a distinction between figure and form. Uh, so, I mean, uh, um, uh, so uh, it seems a distinction uh, between human and non human constitute as a distinction between uh, one figure and another figure, not a uh, figure and form. Uh, mm -hmm. So, for example, uh, when uh, post humanist uh, theorists uh, uh, tell about uh, non uh, human and non uh, human entities, uh, uh, they um, I mean, uh, they uh, picture uh, for us about um, uh, images of animals uh, uh, or uh, 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 some objects or, and other um, uh, entities who has a place and who uh, may um, uh, 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 list for projection of a uh, human uh, image. Uh, therefore, a uh, place of a uh, human uh, being, a uh, human presence in a uh, theory and in perception, uh, not uh, not exclusive. Uh, for example, uh, for Guattarian uh, domains, flows, phila, uh, university, universes, and territories, uh, which excludes not only uh, human as object. Uh, but as a place, uh, what do you uh, think about uh, a more complete uh, the construction of uh, human and non-human with the uh, exclusion uh, not only human exclusivity, but the uh, place of uh, human, uh, the uh, statement of uh, its question? Okay, um, just let me see if I've if I understood, so so you're asking um, not about you know so about deconstruction of the human, which doesn't simply um, want to kind of question you know the uh, the boundary between the human and the non-human as as if they were two distinct forms. Is that what what you were saying at the beginning? But rather the very place, um, uh, the very place from which this distinction could be made. Uh, yeah, I mean, um, uh, Guattarian book, uh, his, his analytic cartographies, uh, where ah, he. Okay. Uh, yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, for uh, for domains, it's a scheme to access. Uh, you know. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I guess the qu I mean, um, what are we talking about when we talk about the human? I guess you know that's that's the key thing, um, and in a way, all the thinkers we've discussed, they'll say that um, you know, whenever there's a kind of um, you know, the privileging of the human involves the privileging of some kind of property or characteristic. Um, which is, you know, uniquely human. So, and, you know, the, the favorite candidates are like, you know, something like uh, 
rationality or self-consciousness um, or freedom. Okay. Um, now, Guattari, yeah, I mean, obviously Guattari in his work and, you know, also with Deleuze, he calls all those things into question. He, he thinks all those kind of, um, you know, positive characterizations of what constitutes the exception of the human are, um, you know, metaphysically dubitable. And, uh, but um, then you get into, the, okay, another way of asking this is that it's about like really, if you're asking about, you know, the, the place from which you're making this distinction, you're asking about the status of the subject. Because that's it's really what it's about. And Kant, all these, you know, Guattari and Deleuze and others, they are anti-Kantian. They reject Kant's claim that, um, uh, that the subject is not an object in the world, cannot be located or situated within the world, because the subject is the condition um, of for experiencing or knowing the world. Um, so if you're, if you're going to make this move, well, what you, need, you need to kind of, um, you know, to subvert this, um, this Kantian claim about, you know, about the subject. And here, I mean, here, I think usually the claim is that this is, um, you know, the subject well, there's two things, is that in Kant, um, Kant doesn't really identify, you know, the human with, you know, transcendental subjectivity, but he says that any cognizing being um, would instantiate some of these, um, these structures, these, uh, you know, the synthetic powers of, of transcendental subjectivity. But famously, he calls this subject, you know, this subject is anonymous and impersonal in Kant. Um, and um, even a thinker like Heidegger, you know, Dasein is kind of, you know, Dasein is not the human being. It, it's, it, it's the place where, you know, the, uh, the question of human being is, is kind of raised and articulated, but it can't be simply identified with, again, the, you know, the, the human is anthropologically conceived. Um, but so in a way, these two kind of forms of, in a way, the transcendental subject in Kant, you know, the, the radical, you know, that's like the being, which is in each case mine in, in Heidegger. These are both um, philosophical, you know, moves that, um, you know, suspend that are, you know, put metaphysics at a distance, say that metaphysics, the problem with metaphysics is that it begins, it makes kind of, it starts kind of, it, it claims to be able to know substance, you know, i.e. what is, um, without um, first investigating, you know, the, uh, the, the conditions of possibility for or being able to think or know about anything. Okay, um, and so part of like this kind of um, you know anti-humanism, this rejection of kind of Kantian transcendental humanism is is also kind of well, is uh, it's either a way of it's either kind of saying that Kant's you know epistemological critique of metaphysics is not radical enough, is, is itself too metaphysical um, because um, pure apperception still privileges self-consciousness and self-consciousness is a, the, the dualism of form and content and of concept and intuition, this is still metaphysical, okay? Um, that would be like, you know, a kind of a, kind of a deconstructive kind of a critique of that move. Or you can say that um, the Kantian subject is precisely, um, it's, it's simply the subject of representation and that we have a kind of a, there is this, you know, we have this non-representational or sub-representational access to reality um, and that we can, you know, 
think and experience, you know, the in itself without this kind of going through, taking the detours through these conditions of representation. Um, the, with the former, um, the problem is that the, with the former, the, um, you know, the critique of metaphysics becomes, threatens to become paralyzing and threatens to kind of, in a way, the more suspicious you become of metaphysical naivety, of any kind of positive characterization of, um, you know, critical conditions, then the more the risk is that, you know, you end up, you paint yourself into a corner where all that's left is radical alterity, some kind of sheer kind of undescribable transcendence, okay? So in a way, you know, you, you criticize kind of the, the, the residues of dogmatism in, you know, critical epistemology um, and, the, and the Kantian critique of metaphysics, but only to find yourself in a position where your critique of critique, you know, leaves you, you know, becomes, you know, at least kind of uh, you know, functionally indiscernible from, you know, a kind of either a mysticism or a kind of, you know, uh, theological dogmatism. In other words, the other, you know, the ineffable, the, the indescribable comes in through the back door. Alternatively, if you think, if you think that there are, you know, we can circumvent representation because we can, you know, we can know and experience the world, you know, um, at this kind of sub-representational level, then um, you have to kind of, then it seems that you're back into a kind of, you know, no longer, you know, you're doing metaphysics again. In other words, you, you have a recourse to intuition. You claim that we just intuit kind of things in themselves. And those things in themselves may not be objects, but they are things like dynamic flows, fluxes of becoming, etc. cetera. Um, so whatever the kind of, um, you know, so in other words, I'm not convinced it's possible in a way to collapse the place, you know, the, uh, the subject, you know, something like transcendental subjectivity is the place from which, um, you know, conditions of knowledge and experience um, are, you know, identified or kind of characterized without finding yourself in either one of those two kind of undesirable positions. Um, so this is why I think the problem is, um, you know, once you realize that um, if, by, if by humanism or if by you mean the, the identification of the human with the rational animal, you know, the kind of, the, or whatever, or the kind of the, the animal, the kind of the self-conscious animal, et cetera, then you could say, well, that's not, you know, in a way, this tradition the tradition that I think leads in Marx doesn't make those, is not kind of, doesn't resort to metaphysical humanism in this sense. Um, and if that's not what you mean, then um, what exactly is, you know, then it's like, what, what is it you're objecting to? Um, in other words, if it's just subject, something like transcendental subjectivity, you're saying that that's the ultimate kind of, uh, you know, hiding place for humanism, um, then your critique of humanism is actually coincides with, I mean, with um, religious anti-humanism, because there, there, there's a critique of humanism, which is like theological and dogmatic, okay, which wants to kind of say, human beings are miserable, kind of, you know, miserable creatures, oh. sinful, and, um, you know, they shouldn't, the problem is that, you know, humanism elevate, illegitimately elevates the human and human beings need to know their place. But that's a very, that's not a kind of a, a new claim. That's a, that's a kind of a familiar claim. So in a way, that's why um, I'm not, you know, what is at stake in the critique of humanism and what is being objected to in the figure of the human? Uh, and I, you know, part of like, it was clear up to a point what the, uh, what was objectionable um, 
But I think that there's, you know, it's, I think, possible to show that, you know, the, um, in a way, the, the targets, you know, the, 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 phil, you know the, the philosophical targets that are kind of, you know, you know, surreptitiously being targeted in the critique of humanism, I can't Hegel and Marx, um, are, are being attacked for, also there's a kind of an ideological components of the critique, which I think if you unpack it is, it's radical credentials are really kind of dubious. So, um, yeah, that's, that's, again, I don't know if I've kind of addressed, you know, I don't know if I've, that's a satisfactory response. Uh, yeah, uh, things I, you uh, right, uh, tell about uh, Dasein uh, here, their presence, uh, this object in, uh, is near to a uh, Guterian uh, interpretation. Uh, but I mean uh, more scientific, uh, not, or not religious. Uh, I'm not mm -hmm. in God and any uh, superstitions. Uh, um, uh, so uh, flows and territories, uh, basic uh, Guterian uh, concepts. Uh, flows has, uh, and? Conca concrete uh, scientific uh, correlations. Uh, for example, okay. um, each uh, mach organ machines, design machine, is uh, uh, defined as a cut of any uh, flows. Uh, mm -hmm. What is the flows? Uh, it's a demographic flows. It's a flows of a genetic code as a flow of uh, uh, words, is a flow of instrumental activities, is a flow of uh, commodities and monies and other uh, flows uh, includes uh, flows of energy, uh, stuff, and uh, information uh, who uh, uh, circulate in society and other nature. Uh, but its uh, flows are circulate in uh, uh, different places. Uh, for uh, there is a, a place of a human body, uh, the uh, concrete in uh, uh, and mis miserable in. Uh, uh, in me uh, meters in square. Uh, therefore, uh, more abstract uh, spaces, uh, more abstract territories, uh, for example, uh, ter um, normatic territory of uh, uh, human activity. Uh, design is a, a good uh, illustration. Mm -hmm. uh, so I uh, suggest uh, if uh, we uh, talk about a uh, human and non-human. Uh, we talk about uh, uh, two figures, uh, not about figures and um, uh, form, uh, not about uh, many uh, uh, flows of objects of any nature and uh, places uh, which are cut and uh, interacted. Uh, that's what I mean. Thanks. Okay. Okay. Uh, th okay, thanks. Thank you. Uh, should I read? Uh, there's a couple more questions, I guess. Oh, so there's a question from Amanda. Um, can you say more about bad and good forms of totality? If bad totalities are illusions that dupe us, what forms, illusions are implicated in good totalities? Is there a need to make a distinction between the qualities uh, the qualities of impossibility that reside within good and bad totalities. Um, well, the, I guess the distinction between, you know, the, the good and the bad totality is, I mean, Marx, it's not, you know, Marx doesn't say this, but um, it's um, Adorno and, um, you know, Postone in the, in the kind of the examples I was discussing earlier. Um, so why is um, you know why is capital a bad totality? Um, because um, it's uh, 
because um, the claim. Well, you have to. There's two ways of unpacking, you know. I guess the, the meaning of good and bad here, um, and I, obviously Adorno says, you know, the whole is the false, um, uh, you know, the untrue. Um, the claim is that um, Marx it has a, you know an imminent critique of capital because. Um, his analysis um, of the social forms through which capital, um, you know, through which capital and labor, you know, reproduce themselves, um, is um, involves. Um, involves a mystification, um, a mystification that prevents us from um, it's very, I mean, I don't want to say, I mean, the danger is always to kind of talk about things like, again, to come up with kind of a positive characterization of um, of human capacity that is being curtailed or inhibited. And look, so exploitation in Marx is an analytical category. When Marx says that labor is exploited, um, he means that this is, um, that capital's claim to be, um, you know, to be fairly remunerating the laborer for um, their their labor power hides um, you know hides the fact that they are being um, the conditions under which they exchange their labor power to the capitalist means that they are precluded from benefiting from the products of that labor um, and. Capitalism, in a way, capitalism insists that everything is exchanged, um, you know, fairly and equally for, for you know for its value. But the discrepancy between the value, um, uh, the value of labor power, you know, and you know the the value of labor power when it's sold. And the value generated through the consumption of labor power, that this is um, this inequality is um, violates you know um, the tenets of capitalist ideology, which says that everything should be exchanged fairly and equally. So, in other words, there's a kind of a, there's an expropriation of value um, from the, uh, the exchange of labor power, which is, um, I guess, you know, um, unfair, um, you know, by capital's own lights, okay? It's like, because, precisely because equality um, and equivalence are the two, um, you know, the, or, or tenets or kind of, of, of capitalist ideology. So the fact that this equality and equivalence is, you know, is, you know, is upheld on the basis of inequality and non-equivalence points to a kind of, uh, you know, um, a contradiction, okay? Uh, a contradiction in capitalist ideology. So um, the second claim is, is I think, um, domination okay so exploitation is is kind of um you could say that the kind of the you know the claim that capital is exploitative is um you know we uses um the categories of capitalist ideology against themselves um the claim that capital 
is um, is a form of domination, I think is um, abstract domination. That's more, um, you know, that's, I'm not sure if it's simply possible to, you know, if it's so easily kind of describable as like kind of a, an imminence. Um, well, I guess, I mean, just thinking about it, you say that um, concrete domination is when, you know, human beings are ruled by hierarchies or castes or systems of, of privilege, um, which are irrational. Okay, which are just simply kind of, you know, um, you know, stipulated by, you know, which are simply enforced um, by violence. Um, again, um, capitalism, you know, proclaims, you know, equality and, and, and rights. Um, but because of the exploitative neighbor, because of the exploitative character of, um, of wage labor, uh, it means that um, a whole, you know, you know, the majority of the human population is, um, you know, finds itself dominated. One class finds itself dominated by another class, and moreover, both those classes are dominated um, by, you know, the uh, the auto reproduction of of capital because both bourgeois and proletarians are mere kind of, they play a social role, um, which is determined by, um, you know, the, the reproduction of value, of capital. So here again, this is also kind of, I think, makes sense as an imminent critique, because he's saying that the claim um, that relations between human beings should be non-coercive, um, is false because in fact, you know, human beings are, you know, coerced or compelled, you know, to sell their labor power because they have no alternative. Um, and that coercion involves, um, um, even if it's, um, it doesn't directly involve acts of violence, although it frequently does, you know, with original accumulation, if you think of like, you know, uh, sweatshops, etc. It often does involve kind of you know violence and intimidation, but even if it doesn't, it involves a kind of um, um, a violation of the um, you know of a tenet of bourgeois ideology, which claims that human beings ought to be self-determining. Okay, so. I think I think both uh, so the kind of capital is a bad totality. I think can be reconstructed without appealing to any kind of transcendent, you know, yardstick of rightness or wrongness. It's but by its own, you know, by the lights of bourgeois ideology, you know, uh, capitalism is exploitative and and uh, and domineering. Um, and the fact that it kind of immiserates human beings, more and more human beings, that's also, um, instead of, um, you know, um, freeing human beings from want and scarcity, as it, as it claims to, it actually kind of, it only frees a select, you know, a, a diminishing portion of the human population from want and scarcity, while inflicting you know want and scarcity on, on the majority so i think all those denunciations are you know don't invoke any kind of transcendent metaphysical values um, um the good what the good totality would be is like just negatively it would be one it would be um where all of these um where exploitation and domination have been abolished, and again, where human beings can relate to one another um, without, um, you know, without having to compete for resources and without having to kind of, uh, you know, um, you know, without these kind of, um, you know, gratuitous antagonisms, you know, that that are, you know, part and parcel of the um, the conditions of capitalist existence. Um, 
Okay, and then the second part, is there a need to make distinctions between the qualities and impossibility that reside within good and bad totalities? Um, well, I guess the part of Marx, what Marx is saying is that the, you know, the, uh, the possibility for the good totality is, you know, implicit or imminent in the bad totality because the elimination of want, the elimination of scarcity, um, the satisfaction of all basic, you know, material human needs is already there with, with capitalist production. Um, um, but the reason it's, uh, but it's, it's impossible to eliminate those, um, those needs so long as this, uh, as the, the capitalist class relation persists, so long as exploitation and domination persists. So everyone could be, you know, uh, fed, clothed, you know, have their basic kind of needs satisfied, but um, the, uh, the totality is structured in such a way as to preclude that. So that's why it has to be, you know, abolished. Um, um, so yeah, so I guess the, the good, um, Again, yeah, I, I think it's once you've identified on the basis of an imminent diagnosis of what is um, contradictory or you know inconsistent in the um, the norms you know proclaimed by capitalist ideology, you know the basic norms that govern capitalist ideology, then you can you know indicate um, you know the abolition of those incompatibilities or Kind of inconsistencies would point towards the good, the, the characteristics of the good totality. Um, that's, I don't know if that's um, a plausible answer. Um, I guess that's all I can say for now. Um, thank you, Ray. Um, that, that's a lot, and thank you. Um, and I'm, I'm not going to ask you to answer this now, but um, I guess the, just to mo what motivated my question was the idea of the place of illusion um, mm -hmm. in itself. Oh, yes. And yeah. that there's this kind of idea that one defeats the illusion and sees um, kind of has some veracity to mobilize the politics as opposed to um, the mechanism of like um, representation. So I guess what was interesting to me was what can we see as, you know, it, if we cannot dispose of illusions, um, what illusions can be seen to be, um, let's even say pragmatically useful as uh, like, even if we talk about like a pragmatic idealism, but what kind of, um, maybe we wouldn't call them illusions then. <laughs> You know, um, so yeah, I, I'm not asking you to say now because I know there's many other questions, but I guess that's what was also um, making me wonder about these different conditions of the, the register of the image um, and what we um, commune around in terms of mythologies, illusions, or truths, if, if we could call them that. Um. No, actually, yeah, I forgot. You, you mentioned, you know, you ask about illusions in your question. Just very quickly, um, I guess, you know, the, the fetishism of commodities is like, it's not a subjective misrepresentation of an objective state of affairs. It's, you know, Marx's claim is that the misrepresentation is at the level of, of commodities, of relations amongst commodities. So in a way, uh, commodity fetishism is something that, you know, is a relation commodities have to one another. So it's not simply... This is why it's not a kind of a, it's it's a kind of a, a socially necessary illusion, and it's not simply something that you can overcome subjectively. Yeah, that's what, that's what so like even subjectivity is structured by this kind of um, you know objective misrepresentation. So misrepresentation is no longer on the side of the subject; it's objects kind of misrepresent one another. Um, but this objective misrepresentation that conditions human relations between human beings. 
Um, and that's a more radical claim. That, that, that's why ideology, you know, ideology is in things, you know, not just in our kind of, uh, in our consciousness. And that's why it's not, this is why a kind of a change of consciousness doesn't suffice. That's why Marx is not a young Hegelian. Because if, if, if you could just kind of cast off your illusions through, through kind of critical self-reflection, then, you know, it wouldn't be, but the whole problem Marx says is, you know, you can't just do this, okay? Um, and that's why consciousness itself can't simply kind of alone doesn't provide the leverage for kind of you know for revolutionary transformation. Um, okay, uh, thanks. Okay, um, there's a, a question from John B. Do those and Guattari incur both of these consequences? Uh, could you say what you meant by the, both consequences? John? That was when um, you were talking earlier. Are they both mystification and um, claiming to have intuition of noumena? The two consequences of uh, disposing of transcendental subjectivity. Uh, um, yeah, I think they certainly have the second consequence. I mean, the kind of because. Um, you know, um, yes, there is a resort, well, explicitly in, you know, Deleuze's kind of engagements with Bergson, you know, the, the method of, you know, Deleuze explicitly endorses, you know, and wants to radicalize Bergson's method of intuition. It's more, in, in, in Anti-Oedipus, it's more complicated, but um, I mean, it, it's most sophisticated in A Thousand Places. In Anti-Oedipus, like, the, well, the claim is like, you know, with the um, the account of uh, desiring production, um, this is um, it's just a claim about um, okay. It's it's no longer a claim. It's no longer a priori knowledge of substance, but it seems to be um, a priori knowledge of flows of you know becoming. So like all these flows. Um, you know, these flows of production, the three syntheses of production are simply kind of set out before us. And the um, question is like, yeah, why, you know, why does everything flow? What does it mean to say that there are these flows of like, you know, and, th and think of, I mean, there's a quote on the handout. I mean, I didn't, but when they, they talk about, um, sorry, uh, Yeah, it's, um, you know, the first characterization they give of, um, you know, of, of code, um, you know, every machine has a sort of code built into it, stored up inside it. Um, you know, they talk about code, uh, they talk about recording, transmission, data, uh, they talk about chains, you know, signifying chains, which, you know, are made up of non-signifying elements. Already that... The, the account of desiring production is, is conceptually saturated, okay? It's full of distinctions, characterizations. Um, how, you know, on what basis can you, do you, you know, I mean, it's, it's like, you know, how, you know, how do you know that? How do you just start talking about, how do you just plug into the kind of, uh, the process of desiring production in a way that allows you to kind of, you know, um, it's not phenomenological. The whole point is desiring production doesn't simply kind of, you know, um, you know, manifest itself or express itself in consciousness. So how do they, you know, how do they know, how are they able to say all these things about desiring production? I mean, it's brilliant. It's, it's, it's dazzling, you know, but then as soon as you stop and ask, like, you know, you know, they're telling you all this stuff that's giving you this incredibly detailed and ingenious description, you know, of, you know, the, uh, you know, of reality producing itself, assembling itself. How are they able to do this, you know? So in that regard, I think um, there is, a, you know, I mean, um, yeah, they, they incur the, uh, 
the consequence, not, I mean, they're always fighting off the kind of the theological consequence or the kind of the, the, the recourse to kind of, uh, and it's to their credit that they, they you know, um, last week we talked a lot about how they, they, they do this. But again, when they talk about, um, you know, so their claim about the coincidence of construction and expression and why the plane of consistency has to be constructed through this process, you know, that's, uh, um, you know, that's, that's their attempt to stave off the kind of, uh, you know, the threat of mysticism. Um, but yeah, it poses um, other problems. So they definitely incur one of the consequences, the consequence of intuition, and they only stave off the other consequence with, you know, with great difficulty. Um, Um, Thank you. Okay, there's a question from James Wilkin. I say on, uh, you say on page 32 of the essay that the human is the name of absolute negativity. Could you elaborate? And in your essay on Angelaki, the last sentence is that history dispossesses us even as it provides a sole resource of becoming free and history is a recursive loop. Can you explain more on your view of history? Um, I should, okay, the claim, actually, I'm, I, I'm not sure I sh I, I'm entitled to say that the human is the name of absolute negativity, precisely because um, that is yet again to kind of um, to make a move, you know, to name, to give, you know, to give a proper name to something which is supposed to be the kind of, um, you know, the, the destitution of propriety. Okay. So that's, um, I think, that was uh, what I meant was that it's not an absolute negativity. If you say it's absolute negativity, then you kind of, you abstract it and you make it into something like a kind of, uh, you, you, the, the danger of reifying it is, is there. Um, in a way, it's, um, in a way, the human is the place for the articulation of relative and absolute negativity. It might be a better formulation. In a way, the kind of um, because um, you know the what we know of ourselves, what we call human, the traits that we you know use to positively characterize what we call the human, are all um, involve um, you know specific historical conditions, um, you know, and, and social relations. Um, and the mistake is to kind of, you know, uh, to reify them or to kind of hypostatize them on the one hand. But that doesn't mean, you know, the, the, uh, the corresponding mistake would be to say, and I think in a way, this is a problem with, in a way, the, you know, the, the kind of the generic given in, in you know, Badiou or Larouel is to say the human is simply kind of this... Um, this point of absolute kind of, you know, uh, this zero degree of radical imminence um, or this, uh, the voided animal in Badiou is, that, is there that you, by absolutizing this negativity or this subtraction from specific predicates, you hypostatize it once again. Um, so, so yeah, so I, would, I, I wouldn't use that. I would say you know, the human is the name um, for um, the relation, I guess, or the uh, the conjunction of relative and absolute negativity, as opposed to the name of absolute negativity. Um, okay, and then second about the um, the Angelaki paper, um, history dispossesses us even as it provides a sole recourse of becoming free. Well, the claim would simply be, and I think it's the claim that I actually think that um, interesting enough, Adorno. I think says something similar in the, although this was written before I'd read that essay, the, the essay on progress, is that the danger, look, if history is an unfolding catastrophe, as it is for Benjamin, okay, um, and this, you know, it's this storm kind of blowing from paradise, you know, and there's this accumulating wreckage, um, and that the wreckage is what you know the bourgeoisie called progress, okay? But it's actually kind of just this uh, relentless, you know, 
accumulation of suffering, okay, and dispossession, etc. Well, then the danger there is always that, you know, there's a point, you know, the uh, paradise is the point of origin, okay? Uh, and the danger then is of, um, you know, given that there's no transcendent vantage point from which to judge history, history is not an object of judgment. Um, so you have to be careful. Um, and I think this is Adorno's point is that he's, he says that um, actually I have the, um, the passage here. Um, I'll quickly, I just need to. Um, um, yes, in that there's a kind of, there's an antimony uh, pinpointed by Adorno. He says you've got the, on the one hand, you've got progress. Um, if history is just an unfolding catastrophe, um, then the only kind of viable or kind of salvageable um, concept of progress would be um, a theological uh, concept, which would convert progress into redemption, okay? So the point, history has to be redeemed, Okay, so the, but redemption would, would, would be a point of transcendence. And this, and in Benjamin, um, you know, um, Benjamin writes, um, um, only for a redeemed mankind has its past become citable in, in its all its moments. Each, in other words, you'd have to be able to redeem history would be to kind of to not to, you know, to name and, um, you know, the, uh, the victims. You know, the, the nameless victims of history um, in order to kind of, uh, you know, as a, as a form of restitution uh, that would kind of, um, you know, overcome their, their erasure. Um, but this, this, this means that kind of red, only redemption can, uh, could, you know, is, is, um, could be affirmed, okay? Um, but then, if progress is redemption, history is absurd because it's unnecessary, because God could intervene to save humanity at any moment. Okay? If there is no progress, if progress is just accumulating catastrophe, then it means that the catastrophe could have been stopped at any moment. There's nothing that's necessary, but the whole, it's, it's, a, it's a monstrous absurdity. Um, and the redemption, you know, could happen and, you know, and should happen at any moment because you know God doesn't need history, so God could intervene to redeem humanity at any point. But then history is absurd; it's unintelligible. On the but if hist if the secular alternative is that progress is humanity's self empowerment, okay, humanity's kind of self liberation, self emancipation. But then history is necessary because this this process of self emancipation can only unfold through history which is a dimension of imminence, but then historical suffering is the condition of historical progress, okay? Um, and this is the kind of the, the, the deadlock, you know, that you know, Adorno identifies as if progress is equated with redemption as transcendental intervention, um, it forfeits along with a temporal dimension, its intelligible meaning and evaporates into an ahistorical theology. But if progress is mediatized into history, then the idealization of history threatens and with it both the reflection both in the reflection of the concept as in the reality the absurdity that it is progress that inhibits progress um, in, in other words if this progress is necessary if you think of all this suffering you know all this you know all these crimes um, you know all these atrocities become necessary for the um, the termination of crime or the, you know, the, the cessation of atrocity. So both concepts become absurd. So what Adorno proposes instead is that um, the content of the concept of progress is social and historical. 
and that reconciliation is only possible through antagonism, but not simply by um, affirming kind of uh, reconciliation, because reconciliation is, um, um, is no longer this kind of uh, the culmination, you know, the, the telos of, the, of history as a whole, um, but um, it's, um, it's simply progress is breaking the spell. It's breaking, in a way, the fatal dialectic whereby in trying to free themselves, human beings enslave others, okay? And once human beings realize, you know, the, the only possibility of breaking this kind of interminable dialectic, you know, in a way, dominating domination, in dominating dominations, we dominate nature, then we do dominate animals and, you know, other humans that we treat as animals, um, once we understand, if we can break the spell and see what it is we're, we're doing, then, um, you know, we, as Adorno puts it, we kind of, uh, we step out of the magic spell, even out of the spell of progress that is itself nature. Um, and so it's only kind of by, um, you know, by breaking the spell, which kind of perpetuates this dialectic of enlightenment, that human beings, um, you know, can, you know, realize freedom because they free themselves in a way from the compulsion to dominate domination. Um, and that's why he writes, uh, progress is, uh, progress is the resistance to the perpetual danger of relapse. Um, so it's not progress, it's not this kind of linear kind of movement uh, towards a kind of an ultimate telos. Um, it's simply the, the resistance um, to um, the, uh, you know, the repetition um, of nature, of the compulsion to dominate in humanity's attempt to free itself from nature. Um, um, and that means, you know, according to Adorno, that progress is possible at every moment. Okay, it's not, it's not redemption, you know, if redemption is possible at any moment because history is absurd. It's just this, you know, incessant catastrophe. But what Adorno is saying is that at every point we can, you know, um, you know, we can break the spell. We can step out of this kind of compulsive, kind of um, this compulsion to kind of this confusion whereby we think that we are, you know, we think that we are freeing ourselves by asserting our sovereignty, but in doing so, we're actually only kind of, um, you know, repeating our subjugation um, to nature, to the need to dominate. Um, and what Adorno was saying is that the conditions for breaking the spell um, Amplify you know, in a way are kind of um, you know are socially and historically kind of um, you know um, circumscribed. Okay, there, there's you know it becomes it's you know the possibility of refusing of becoming aware of the of the you know the, the threat of regression is um, is heightened. You know. And it's this heightening that means that, um, you know, that intensifies or in a way augments the possibility um, of resisting, of resisting the relapse um, into nature. So, um, yeah, that's, um, okay, that's a convoluted answer to your question. Um, and I think, yes, and that's what I meant in a way, that's, in a way, that's, in a way, that's how I understand. I mean, that's, I think, you know, a, an excellent kind of a paraphrase of the claim that history dispossesses us, even as it provides us with a role, with a sole resource of becoming free. So the point is that it's not, we can't go back, we can't turn back the clock, 
but in a way, and this is kind of this is Marx's point as well, is that in a way the condition, the extremity of estrangement, you know, is also the condition for you know release, you know, from estrangement. Um, so I think this is also kind of a, a Marxian point. Um, Okay, I better move on. Um, there's another question from Kirill. Um, agree with James Wilkins strongly. You draw on thinkers who use negativity in incommensurate ways. Do you just mean it in the Hegel, Brandom, bent stick in water way? Um, okay, so Brandom, you know, is often, you know, chastised by Hegelians for reducing contradiction to incompatibility. Um, and if you reduce contradiction to incompatibility, then it seems hard, you know, incompatibility, you know, would be something like a, is a relation of, you know, representations are incompatible, kind of assertions are incompatible. And this means that, um, you know, the uh, reason can't, you know, affirm contradiction, can't affirm the kind of the truth of contradiction. Uh, to claim that, you know, to claim that kind of negativity is constitutive of reality or of actuality is to say that everything actual is contradictory, which is a strong Hegelian claim, um, which is not the same thing as saying that, you know, um, because contradiction is in the thing for Hegel, you know, or at least Hegel is traditionally understood. Whereas Brandom seems to be want to be saying that uh, it's not really contradiction; it's just incompatibility, and incompatibility is in us, not in things. Um, I think that, in a way, you know, although I'm very, very sympathetic to Brandom's reasoning, I, yeah, I do think there's a problem here, in that he kind of, um, you know evacuates the Hegelian claim of its kind of, of its charge, okay, um, um, by kind of, you know, relegating, you know, you know, by reducing contradiction to incompatibility and relegating incompatibility to, you know, to assertions or relations amongst assertions. Um, because then it's, it's difficult to see how, for instance, um, like social reality itself could be contradictory. And this is, in a way, if you think about um, the hermeneutics of magnanimity that Brandom wants to kind of, enjoins us to kind of to accept, where, you know, we retrospectively identify, you know, kind of uh, the incompatibilities vitiating, the incompatible commitments vitiating our predecessors' discourse, and we reinterpret them to try to kind of uh, eliminate those incompatibilities. Um, but that's not, you know, the, the Marxian claim is not that. The, the Marxian claim is that the incompat it's, it's not about incompatibilities at the level of beliefs or assertions. It's incompatibilities at the level of, you know, what we do without realizing that we're doing it or, or in, in social reality itself. Um, in a way, that's, there's a political kind of valence to this distinction um, between incompatibility and negativity. So on the one hand, yeah, I, I mean, I'm wary of ontologizing negativity or hypostatizing self-relating negativity. But in social, but I think in a way Marx gives you, you know, in a Marxian register, it does make sense not, not to ontologize it, but to say that there are, you know, to point to the, the you know, inherent, the contradictory structure of social reality, because this reality, in a way, involves, doesn't conform to the, um, it's not straightforwardly kind of uh, objectifiable in the way in which kind of, you know, other, uh, that, that's the whole point about the critique of political economy. It's not simply a representation of reality. Um, it is, you know, the uh, the concepts that Marx, you know, you know, constructs in order to kind of to identify the um, 
you know, the, the machinery through which capital reproduces itself, they're, you know, they're imminent to this, um, you know, this, uh, this social, you know, the, this social structure as such. Um, I mean, again, this needs to be unpacked properly, but I think, I think this is an important claim, actually, why, this is why, in a way, Marx is kind of really still misunderstood um, because people, um, in a way, because if you just junk Marx's Hegelianism or what is still kind of, you know, what he still takes from Hegel and, you know, the critique of representation is crucial here. Uh, it's not that Marx, it's not a kind of, um, it's not that Mar Marx will claim that kind of uh, the speculative identity of subject and object is no longer something to be affirmed, but it's in a way, it's the, um, it's something in a way because capital, um, the speculative identity of, of subject and object kind of articulated by Hegel was actually a symptom of this, um, of their kind of real practical fusion in social reality. Um, and it's this kind of, uh, this identity now operates, you know, behind the back of consciousness, behind the back of spirit. And this is what Marx is trying to kind of excavate or foreground. Um, um, okay, yeah. Um, I, sh I should move on to the uh, next couple of questions. Uh, uh, another question. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, I can't, um, I'm afraid I can't pronounce your name. Uh, but I'll, I'll uh, read Yevgeny your question. Kanaplyov. Okay, Yevgeny. Uh, Yevgeny okay. Yeah. Um, uh, so, my question, when you talk about uh, theological bias uh, against uh, Kantian uh, transcendental skepticism in Deleuze and Guattari's uh, shift from uh, human unity to uh, flow, uh, spa flow spaces, uh, space, uh, what do you mean? Uh, is it a uh, transition from outer reference uh, semiotic like uh, cogito uh, toward, uh, toward uh, hetero reference uh, signifying semiotic with uh, signifying center like uh, Marxism, Leninism or uh, Christian uh, hermeneutics? Uh, I suggest uh, there is an uh, exit out of uh, Cartesian Kantian uh, problematics. Uh, outer referent uh, semiotics and uh, cogito infinite uh, method of uh, radical doubt um, uh, possible uh, through comparative semiotics, uh, natural and social sciences, uh, not uh, theology. Uh, so, uh, um, uh, uh, a simple uh, application, uh, theolo uh, theological and uh, signifying semiotics uh, may be part of uh, this process uh, uh, as a um, contradiction and opposition to outer reference semiotics, uh, not uh, the aim of this uh, deconstruction. Mm -hmm. mm, okay, I'm just... Um... Let me just trying to make sure I, I get what you're what you're saying. Um, okay, so, so um, comparative semiotics is an alternative. Um, I so I, I guess I mean that's you know. Yeah, I mean, that's uh, I'd, I'd like to hear more. I mean, I just don't know enough, you know, about semiotics or comparative semiotics to say anything you know interesting in response um i guess just um what distinguishes semiotics though from um yes i guess what distinguishes semiotics from 
semantics or like as you know of the philosophy of language issues about kind of you know meaning and linguistic meaning as discussed in in philosophy of language this is a, a, an instant i really don't know i mean because i don't just don't know enough about semiotics to kind of to to respond um properly to this to this question um Excuse me, right? Do you wanna uh, keep going because we are almost over three hours? Okay. Yeah. Uh, yes. I'll. I'll. Uh, so. So. Yeah. Thanks. Um, yeah. I need to to think about that, but I can't kind of respond um, right now. Um, okay. There's um. Is it Blissero writes? Um, this is not really a good. No, we don't need to read that. Right. Um, no. It's it's um. I'm quite willing to you know accept that it's uh, I've got it wrong I mean I need to reread because you know I haven't read it I read the drafts I haven't read the latest the published version of um, Spirit of Trust I read the draft a couple of years ago uh, so I'm going on so it's quite it's entirely possible that I'm not being fair to I'm misrepresenting Brandon um, um, so it's not about it's it's, it's uh, yeah, I need to think more about this actually. So, so I take your points. I, that I need to. I can't just kind of, you know, oppose a contradiction to incompatibility in this way. Um, uh, okay, I think that's the uh, um, the end of the uh, the written questions. I'm actually. Uh, it's just after eleven here. Um, I'm afraid, uh, yeah, I'm going to have to, to go. Um, I really want to thank you again, Ray, for participating in this and leading these sessions. And uh, we are all really appreciating your time. And I hope you consider joining us again in the future. Thanks. No, thanks very much. Thanks, Sebadip. Thanks. It was, uh, I really enjoyed it. And it was incredibly productive, actually, for me. So I'm uh, yeah, very happy. Um, so I've done it. So thanks very much, and uh, good luck with the um, the next uh, you know the next sessions. Uh, and I'll, so. I'll you know look forward to kind of hearing about them. So. Yeah.